Ladies and gentlemen, faculty and students, members of the administration and staff, guests uh, from far and, and near, good evening. Uh, welcome to the opening night of the conference, Havel and our crisis. Hidden within the walls of the Prague Castle, there is a beautiful park full of exotic trees, shrubs, and flowers. Uh, it, it is called the Royal Garden. Um, it was established in 1534 by the Bohemian King and Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I of the Habsburg dynasty. And he also added a couple of buildings along the perimeter, such as the Belvedere, which is my favorite, um, uh, an airy summer palace in the Renaissance style. Throughout its existence, the Royal Garden has served as a place for quiet relaxation and entertainment, first for the nobility, more recently for Prague's citizens after the fires of World War I consumed the Habsburg Empire and the first Czechoslovak Republic was born out of the ashes in 1918. Today, it is a little piece of lunch break heaven in the busy heart of the city. The view of Prague from the edge of the Belvedere is stunning. Under your feet, this sprawling panorama of old streets, churches, and bridges disappearing in the distance. To your immediate right, the monumental St. Vitus Cathedral rising to the sky just across the stag moat. It is barely 200 meters away. Uh, the contrast of scales always takes my breath away. It was in the Royal Garden that my one and only direct encounter with Václav Havel took place. Many of our conference guests spent years in daily contact with him as his friends, advisors, supporters, or ambassadors. But I was born several decades too late for that. I was only 10 when the Velvet Revolution against communism took place in Czechoslovakia in 1989. I interacted with Havel, its leader, only the way one interacts with a famous rock star. Anonymously, from afar, following him on TV, radio, and newspaper covers. And a rock star he was in the 1990s, this, this prisoner gone president, this voice of freedom and human rights, this dissident playwright catapulted into power in a twist seemingly taken straight out of his absurdist dramas. Picture a chain-smoking cross of Mick Jagger and Bob Dylan, only way better, sprinkled with bits of Inspector Clouseau, gloriously innocent of any fashion sense, casually dropping Heidegger in his public addresses to the confusion of his audiences. This was Havel in my childhood imagination. Just like I back then, he did not know how to roll his R's and needed a speech pathologist. Unlike I, he seemed entirely oblivious to it, my hero. Within two years of his presidential inauguration, the Soviet troops that had been occupying Czechoslovakia since August 1968 had left the country. Together with my family, friends, teachers, uh, and almost every other fellow citizen, I worshipped him. He was the bee's knees of the Velvet Revolution. One sunny afternoon in early July 1995, I was sitting on a bench in front of the Belvedere when Havel suddenly appeared. Uh, the Royal Garden was completely empty. Um, a pleasant breeze was blowing, occasionally turning strings of water from the nearby fountain into wafts of cool mist. I was stuffing myself with rohlíky se šunko, cheap bread rolls with ham that are the staple of ordinary Czech's diet, uh, and that my mother fixed me for lunch. Out of nowhere, a vanguard of six John Travoltas from Saturday, Saturday Night Fever showed up, bell bottoms, mullet haircuts, and, and all. Right? They were Havel's security detail. Uh, angels announcing the impending arrival of our national redeemer. Their floral shirts provided them with perfect camouflage among the rare botanicals. Two dropped down ninja-like from a wall to my right. Another few emerged from the bushes to my left. And in the next moment, St. Václav sat down on a bench next to mine and exhaled. He was taking a break from his presidential office in the castle. I froze. 
I, I do not know how long the encounter lasted. It is in the nature of, of divine epiphanies that time comes to a standstill and a window on eternity opens up. Four or five minutes, I spend them with my eyes bulging out, one hand hanging from the rohlik stuck in my mouth, the, the other clutching a greasy napkin in my lap. All I could think as I was staring at the rock star president was, don't stare, don't stare. <laughs> in the next instant, he got up and was gone, as was his disco angel entourage. No words were exchanged. I bent down, picked up the rohlik that had fallen out of my mouth, dusted it off and resumed eating it. <laughs> An hour later, I was at the US Embassy, just a few streets down below the castle. Earlier that spring, I won a national high school competition for a scholarship to an American boarding school, and I was in town to get my visa. The president of the New York City-based foundation that organized the competition is here with us tonight as one of our conference guests. She and her husband, who served as the US ambassador to Czechoslovakia in the 1980s, were close associates of Havel. After the Velvet Revolution, the American embassy in Prague was inundated with entry visa requests. It was a long queue of applicants forming in front of the entrance every day. Um, so in my hometown, in the mountains of northern Moravia, about four hours east of Prague, my mother woke me up around midnight, gave me a rucksack with those rohlike. I boarded a 1 a.m. train, made the trip to the capital, and joined the line by six, early enough to guarantee myself one of the first spots. It was my third attempt, and this time I got inside the building. After a brief interview, the desk officer took my passport and told me to return in the afternoon. When I received the passport back, it had an F1 student visa in it. My first encounter with Havel then coincided with my first encounter with America and freedom, and not just any kind of freedom. It was the freedom of a 16-year-old about to spread his wings, leave his childhood home, family, and country, and set off on a journey of discovery to the new world. Jaromir Jager was taking the NHL by storm, winning one Stanley Cup after another. Madeleine Albright, another Czech native, was making waves on the international stage as the fierce US ambassador to the United Nations and would soon rise even further, becoming the first ever female US Secretary of State. As far as I was concerned, there were no bounds to what I could make of myself, only my will and hard work. The gift of opportunity I had received through the scholarship far exceeded the gifts brought to ordinary Czechs and Slovaks by the Velvet Revolution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and so on. My grandparents grew up in poverty. My parents have no college education. Nobody in the family knew a word of English. When the boarding school sent us the scholarship award letter, my grandfather thought the tuition figure, roughly eight times our annual uh, household income, was a typo. When my grandmother lovingly assured him that his eyesight was a typo and the figure was correct, he announced we should call Secretary Albright to lend me some money for books at Berkshire School. As it turned out, she was not listed in our local yellow pages, <laughs> and we did not have a phone to begin with. My parents and my grandparents emptied their savings accounts. They stuck about $160 in my pocket and put me on a plane across the ocean. What did I discover when I arrived here? What did my American freedom look like? <laughs> it was a hard landing. Uh, first and foremost, I discovered my ignorance. Um, I thought I knew everything, but I did not know anything. Um, coming over with just two years of English, taught by teachers who were barely a textbook chapter ahead of me, I had no idea what anybody around me was saying. Uh, where to go after getting off the plane at JFK, how to order food in the school cafeteria, how not to fail yet another test. Second, 
I discovered the stunning diversity of the world around me, uh, which was full of surprises and stories that could not be reduced to any simple categories. Perhaps nobody embodied this fascinating contingency better than my AP politics teacher. Born in Sudan, she fled to America as a teenager, put herself through law school, became a naturalized citizen, and then turned down a lucrative career in corporate litigation in order to teach high schoolers key Supreme Court decisions. I expected to live among skyscrapers and hang out with students driving the 1965 Mustang convertible like Brandon does in the Beverly Hills 90210 series, then running on Czech TV. Instead, I was living in the backwoods of Western Massachusetts and hanging out with an African refugee. <laughs> Last but not least, I discovered responsibility. That I lost 15 pounds in my first month abroad, that it took 10 days for my letters to reach my parents and grandparents, and another 10 for their replies to reach me, uh, that I got about as much meaning out of a page of Supreme Court rulings as I did out of a bowl of alphabet soup for dinner. <laughs> Failure was not an option. I owed it to the foundation, to the 400 other applicants it did not choose, to the boarding school that accepted me, to my family. $160 buys a lot of Rohliki Sashunko. Uh, indeed, I owed it to Havel, his fellow dissidents, and the Velvet Revolution, without which I would not have been able to travel behind the Iron Curtain to, to begin with. The reason I have decided to convene this conference is simple. Havel, America, and freedom, the constellation in which I came of age, seems to have vanished from our galaxy. Havel died more than a decade ago. Madeleine Albright, who forged a special friendship with him, helped him get the Czech Republic into NATO, and was to be our main conference speaker, passed away this March. Freedom no longer seems to mean responsibility, humility, awareness of one's limits, or sensitivity to individual human stories. Instead, it means prideful self-assertion of the I can do whatever the hell I want sort, screaming matches among factions trapped in their own social media echo chambers, violent outbursts of anarchy, and predictable black and white narratives flattening human identity to Democrat or Republican, victim or perpetrator, he or she pro-life, pro-choice, and so on. I mean, where is the surprise in all of this? The beauty of unexpected contingency. Where are the shades of gray that Havel used to talk about? America no longer seems to be the end of history toward which the long lines in front of the US Embassy in Prague were hoping to progress, but more like the return of history, judging by last year's mob run on the US Capitol. Roe v. Wade, which my AP politics teacher had me memorize, is now useless knowledge, apparently. Truth and love must prevail over lies and hatred, Havel famously proclaimed during the Velvet Revolution. I remember it as vividly as I remember the feeling I had going to the demonstrations with my family. For a fleeting moment, it seemed that everyone, all those tens of thousands of people freezing in public squares, joined hands in that belief. But that world is so distant now that I have started to wonder, did it actually exist? Uh, was it real or am I making it up? Am I romanticizing Havel and my early adolescence, inventing things out of nostalgia mixed with despair? As Western leaders from Donald Trump via Marine Le Pen to Viktor Orban incite hatred and division, as fake news and disinformation proliferate, corrupting language and stripping truth of any meaning, as Russian tanks roam around Eastern Europe, my teenage memories increasingly take on the same dreamlike quality as surrounds my only encounter with Havel. I am not sure it all happened. And so, in the interest of defending my sanity, I am driven more and more to search for answers and assurance. 
when I was in Prague with my students this past January. I wanted to show them the Royal Garden, but the gate by the Belvedere was locked. The park is closed during winter months. Not wanting to get my students in trouble, I took them to other parts of the castle and then returned alone late at night. I scaled the wall and landed in the garden in a crouching position that would have made Havel's disco ninja bodyguards proud. <laughs> How long did I spend there? I don't know, five minutes, an hour. It is in the nature of memory that in the middle of a winter night, you can find yourself sitting in the sun and feel summer breeze spraying you with droplets of water. The bench, the fountain, all the furniture was there. The stage remains intact. And the playwright turned president, um, I hope to catch a glimpse of him in the lectures, discussions, theater performances and film screenings immediately ahead of us. I hope our guests will revive him for us and in doing so perhaps show us a way forward. I would be remiss not to thank the many organizations and individuals who have joined hands and made this organization, uh, this conference happen on campus. <clears throat> These include the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and the Center for the Arts and Humanities. Off campus, I wish to point out the Václav Havel Library in Prague and Zuzana Hotskova, its brilliant international projects manager, and the Czech Center in New York City with its equally marvelous director, Miroslav Konvalina. To these names, at least three dozen, maybe more, others uh, must be added. Way too many for the brief amount of time I have left. So allow me to mention just a few. Gail Maroon and Ruth Jackson from the Office of the President, Arne Norris, Laura Meter and George, George Sopko from Communications, Ian Murphy and Arlene King Lovelace from ITS, Marjorie Gallant from the Department of Theater and Dance, Jackie Terrassa from our Museum of Art, Whitney King from the Allen Institute, Jenny Oder, Candice Parent from the Department of Government. David Green, president of Colby College, was there first when I got the idea more than a year ago. He immediately recognized the event's potential, gave his full support, and told me to run with it. My gratitude belongs to them all. Now, before I introduce our keynote speaker, please join me in welcoming Jan Havranek, Deputy Chief of Mission at the Czech Embassy to the United States in Washington, D.C., who will deliver a brief message of greetings on behalf of the Czech Republic. Uh, good, good evening, good evening. Thank you, Milan, for your kind introduction and many thanks uh, uh, actually for sharing your personal story. Uh, a very nice Czech-American segue. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I could deliver the standard opening remarks saying how happy uh, I am that the first iteration of the Havel Albright Transatlantic Dialogues is taking place here at Colby College and that I welcome you warmly on behalf of the Czech Embassy in DC and also the Czech Presidency of the European Union. Indeed, I am and I do, uh, but uh, coming here was not just a mere protocol assignment. Uh, it is a real honor and privilege to be addressing you today at an event dedicated to two great leaders uh, of our times and many more, but uh, first and foremost, Václav Havel and Madeleine Albright. Their legacy is as important as ever today when we face the most profound threat to the transatlantic civilization in decades. For many years, we have debated the myriad of growing potential challenges and various risks and threats, and we've tried to address all crises within a framework of reason and perhaps hope of change for better, until Putin crushed that illusion and unleashed the worst demons of the 20th century by shedding innocent blood in Ukraine and by coercing and threatening America and Europe. For many years, we have debated the utility of the institutions that came out reborn of the transitions of the 1990s, that is NATO and the European Union. And having been a privileged participant of endless committee meetings in Brussels, I've often found myself frustrated with the lack of unity, lack of understanding and lack of solidarity. Whatever happened to the community bound by common values and not only by common interests, I often wondered. But Russia's war 
in Ukraine has presented a real test for the West. When the aggression began, some believed that Russia would quickly prevail, Ukraine would surrender, and that NATO and the European Union would split or cease to exist, cease to function. None of that has fortunately happened. So far, we've come out much stronger and more united. But we're not off the hook. We owe this unity and bravery. Uh, we owe this unity to the bravery of the people of Ukraine. Their heroism reminded us of the values we have taken uh, for granted. And their sacrifice has given us, the West, a second chance. We therefore must not abandon Ukraine. We have a moral obligation to continue our support, both militarily and humanitarian. But our commitment is also a commitment to Europe. Today, we have to find the courage to re-evaluate many of the, the approaches so far. That is why my country chose a Havel-like slogan, Europe as a task, as the motto of the presidency of the Council of the European Union uh, that is happening now. It gives us an opportunity to reflect together, but it is also a call for accountability and determination and action based on the values that our conscience requires to pursue. If we are to live up to the expectations of this historical moment, uh, our triple challenge is to rethink, rebuild, and repower Europe as the program of the presidency goes. But we must also think beyond Europe and strengthen that transatlantic bond. Like many times in history, we see that the United States can, through their deep political and military engagement in European affairs, contribute to the stability of the continent and tame some of the European darker impulses. And finally, we must continue to enhance our cooperation with like-minded democratic partners. In his first ever speech at NATO headquarters in 1991, Havel said, we feel, and I quote, we feel that an alliance of countries united by a commitment to the ideal of freedom and democracy should not remain permanently close to neighboring countries which are pursuing the same goals. History has taught us that certain values are indivisible. If they are threatened in one place, they are directly or indirectly threatened everywhere. He was, of course, referring to the new democracies of Central Europe 30 years ago, but 30 years on, these words still hold true. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I pass the floor uh, back to Milan and to our keynote speaker tonight, uh, please allow me to share a personal remark. Uh, Václav Havel and Medel Albright both inspired my life and career. And I hope this will be the case for many of the young students uh, and leaders in the audience who are present tonight. But if it was not for Havel and Albright's leadership and work, uh, their dedication to Europe and America working together, I would not be addressing you here tonight as a proud Atlanticist. And I want to thank Michael Jantowski, uh, who introduced me to both leaders, both Havel and Albright 20 years ago, for charting that transatlantic path for me. Thank you. As I said at the beginning, it is a true joy, honor, and privilege to be here with you. Thank you very much. Michal Jantowski, our keynote speaker, comes to us from Prague, where he currently serves as the executive director of the Václav Havel Library, the primary caretaker of the legacy of the late Czech president. He is the keeper of Havel's fire, as one of my children has put it. In November 1989, he joined Havel and others in founding the Civic Forum, an umbrella organization that coordinated the overthrow of the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. And following Havel's presidential election, he became a spokesman, press secretary, and political director. Subsequently, he went on to serve in a variety of key roles as Czech ambassador to the United States, Israel and the United Kingdom, as member of the Senate of the Czech Republic, and as chairman of its Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Security. His long and distinguished career in politics and diplomacy is even more remarkable in light of all his other achievements and activities. He has translated more than 60 volumes of prose, poetry, drama, and nonfiction into Czech, including works by Toni Morrison, Norman Mailer, and Joseph Heller. He has taught American studies <coughs> and Euro-American relations at Charles University and New York University in Prague. His 2014 biography of Václav Havel came out in English, Czech, and more than a dozen other languages and received high acclaim. 
So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him on stage. Uh, well, thank you so much, Milan, for this kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, uh, colleagues, Havelians, uh, which is a term we coined a few years ago at the conference in the other capital of Havel studies in the United States in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, uh, I would love to entertain you with uh, uh, some of my favorite Havel stories, but uh, I was asked by Milan uh, to speak on Havel and our crisis, so I'm afraid this will not be uh, so much of an entertainment. But before I go into that, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Colby College and uh, Milan as the convener of the conference, uh, the Czech Center in New York, and Miroslav Konvalina uh, as uh, the other partner in this uh, endeavor, and, uh, and uh, many of my other friends from back home and from the United States, some of whom are uh, here in this room, and uh, I will thank them collectively. Now, as for the topic, uh, that we are living in an age of crisis seems so self-evident that no one in his right mind would find it worthwhile to argue the point. Yet, mere three years ago, at the time that now seems like a distant past, such a notion would seem to speak more of the jaundiced eye of the beholder or a panic attack than the actual state of affairs. So it might seem to some anachronistic to pose the question of what Václav Havel, who has been dead for 10 years, would think or say about our present crisis. And although I'm usually reluctant to speculate on what Havel would think about current events, a question I'm often asked and which always gives me an uncomfortable feeling of being put in a position of a living Ouija board, the answer to this particular question requires no speculation because the anticipation and indeed experience of our present malady is intrinsic to Havel's thinking and his perspective of modernity. Strange as it may sound, his discovery of the crisis was not derived from a detached analysis of the mainstream of our civilization, the liberal democratic paradigm, the powerful driving forces of the free market, and the liberating, though treacherous, effects of individuation in our everyday lives, but rather from a direct experience of living under a totalitarian system, which he understood not as a denial or aberration of modernity, but as an organic, albeit malignant, offshoot of the arrogant belief that rather than a product, an object of creation or evolution, Man has become the sovereign ruler of the world with the capacity to transform it and adapt it to his wishes and his needs. This made it possible for Havel to consider the crisis of modernity as a universal phenomenon, at least in terms of what used to be called the Western civilization. Unlike deterministic philosophers like Oswald Spengler, however, he did not consider crisis and the decline of the West as an inevitability, but rather as a challenge. He didn't think of history as a deterministic product of material forces, but rather as the work of the human mind and believed that history can change when the mind changes and that it can also change for the better. It was this message that he brought to America in his address to the joint meeting of the US Congress on the 22nd of February, 1990. After identifying himself with the values of freedom and democracy as a patrimony now restored to the newly liberated nations of Central and Eastern Europe, he offered something in return, and I will quote, 
we too can offer something to you, our experience and the knowledge that has come from it. The specific experience I'm talking about has given me one great certainty. Consciousness precedes being and not the other way around, as the Marxists claim, unquote. Now, there were more than a few members of the Congress who seemed to be slightly at a loss about what this meant, and some even came to inquire after the speech. <laughs> but Havel actually made it clear in the following passage, and I will quote again, the salvation of this human world lies nowhere else than in the human heart, in the human power to reflect, in human humility and in human responsibility. Without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing will change for the better in the sphere of our being as humans and the catastrophe toward which this world is headed, be it ecological, social, demographic, or a general breakdown of civilization will be unavoidable. If we are no longer threatened by world war or by the danger that the absurd mountains of accumulated nuclear weapons might blow up the world, this does not mean that we have definitely won." Unquote. In one single paragraph, Havel listed and summed up the multiple crises we are facing today, although he may have been too sanguine about the risks of nuclear war. In fact, Rather than speaking of multiple crises, he spoke about the multifaceted nature of what is one single crisis, signaling that the euphoria to which we all fell prey and which led even some of the most brilliant thinkers of the era to a mistaken belief that history has ended and liberal democracy has prevailed for good, might be temporarily masking the mortal dangers lurking underneath. What has happened to the world over the last three years has been often viewed as a perfect storm of several seemingly unconnected crises. They were in roughly the following order, the crisis of COVID, the crisis of globalization, the crisis of Russian aggression, and the crisis of energy. In Czech, we have a somewhat inelegant saying that the devil always defecates on a single pile. At closer look, though, these catastrophes, far from being unconnected, stem from the same disease of irresponsibility, hubris, and wishful thinking from subordinating reality to what we would like reality to be. Take first, the COVID. This is certainly not the first pandemic in the history of the world, nor is it the first such flu-like vile disease but it is certainly the first such pandemic without a name pointing to its origins, either geographically or through its etiology. Although there is little doubt that the virus first occurred in humans in Wuhan, China, and that it was transmitted to humans from bats, possibly through lab experimentation, it is not spoken of as a Chinese flu, as was the case with the Spanish flu of 1980 to 1920, although that one actually did not origin in Spain, the Asian flu of 1957, the Hong Kong flu of 1968, the Russian flu of 1977, nor do we speak of it as a bad flu as opposed to common flu, avian flu, bird flu, or swine flu. It is named after the acronym of the syndrome coronavirus disease and the last two digits of the year of its first occurrence, 2019. This may seem to be just a technicality, but it is a technicality that effectively sterilizes the disease from possible traces of anyone's responsibility. In this respect, it is in, key it is in keeping with the modern practice of stripping a concept of any connotation that might possibly be offensive, wittingly or unwittingly, to any person or a group of people. The result, Havel would think, are concepts that cannot be used to assign responsibility for the events they denote. The events just happen. Second, although the COVID-19 pandemic was neither the first nor the most deadly in history, 
it seems to have spread the farthest and fastest with more than 600 million cases in less than three years. The epidemiological data show that the main driver of its rapid transmission is the same as the driver of our recent well-being and growth. The COVID clearly spread along the globalization routes together with the goods, services, and tourists that define our current globalized prosperity. Moreover, the tortuous, but in the end largely successful efforts at its containment and at preventing it from spreading further, simultaneously disrupted the global trade routes, logistics chain, and airline schedules to a degree which is still hard to comprehend. Seen from this perspective, the COVID pandemic, although unpredictable as to its timing, place, and severity, was a disaster waiting to happen. It demonstrated with the most terrifying clarity that for all its undeniable benefits, globalization has made the world not more but less stable and not less but more vulnerable since it enormously magnified the amplitude and the speed at which local shocks can reverberate across the globe, causing new local shocks in the process. And then came Putin's invasion of Ukraine, although when it came, it was already something of old news. Putin interfered with the Ukrainian political process ever since he came to power. Putin first used the energy weapon against Ukraine by interrupting the gas deliveries in January 2009. Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014 when he annexed Crimea and helped establish the self-appointed separatist administrations in parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. And since at least 2005, Putin never made a secret of wanting to repair, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century which was in his mind the collapse of the Soviet Union. The writing on the wall was there for all of us to see, yet few people took notice and few of those who did took any precautions. For a long time, for many people in the West, Putin was the first modern Russian politician, a guy who used the internet, dressed in bespoke suits and spoke passable German. He was clearly another man to do business with. Václav Havel, though, was as clear-eyed as ever about a man whose career background was in the KGB, a type of organization Havel had many, albeit involuntary, dealings with. He was horrified by the methods Putin used to suppress the Chechen resistance in the Second Chechnya War of 1999 to 2000, which were enthusiastically approved by the Russian public opinion and paved the way for Putin's presidency. And he recognized the Russian attack against Georgia in 2008 as a part of Putin's grand strategy to restore Russia's greatness. The pattern, starting with the instigation of discontent among minority groups in a neighboring country, followed by armed insurrections or interventions under the guise of peacekeeping, protecting human rights and demilitarization, and continuing with attempts to use these bridgeheads to provoke wider conflicts ending with annexing parts of the target countries and with the de facto control or at least a veto over the destiny of whole countries never changed. At the same time, it was mirrored by gradual steps to dismantle every trace of democracy, suppress the freedom of expression and eliminate political opposition at home. For almost all of that time, the business went on as usual. Havel remarked in an interview in 2008, I quote, the Putin era has brought a new type of dictatorship all the more dangerous for its inconspicuous mask. It is remarkable in that it weds the West of communism with the West of capitalism. The complacency, the naivete, and the cynicism fueled by the seemingly endless flows of cheap Russian gas to European economies and stolen Russian money to European banks 
fueling the rise of various London grads and the prosperity of the yachting industry, guaranteed, however, that it was all going to stay business as usual. And bitter as it may sound, it would be most likely still business as usual if the Ukrainians have not taken a heroic stand for themselves and defied the cynical expectations. And as usual, the reality of what has become a strategic conflict between a revisionist power aiming to obtain the international order of the last 30 years, along with the belief in liberal democracy, the rule of law, political pluralism, and human rights, tends to be obscured by attempts to dress it in more neutral terminology. The purely Orwellian attempts by Putin to present the war as a special military operation and the brutal inhuman aggression as denazification are too obscene and transparent to fool anyone. But speaking on our side, even handedly, of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, as some are want to do, is almost as obscene. Many people are still reluctant to call a spade a spade and the Putin regime for what it really is. Since this Colby College conference about Havel and our crisis is taking place within the framework of the Havel Albright Transatlantic Dialogues by the Václav Havel Library, in honor of two of the great advocates of liberal ideas, humanitarian interventionism and the transatlantic bond, the proper language is easy to find. One of the last books Madeleine Albright wrote is called Fascism, and one of the last books by another contributor to this symposium, Timothy Snyder, who will speak tomorrow, is called Tyranny. What we are fighting against here, all of us, not just the Ukrainians, are the forces of fascism and tyranny aiming to engulf us all. And finally, the energy crisis is the latest, though I doubt it is the last, of the man-made plagues we brought on ourselves. In another exercise of irresponsibility and self-denial, it is now almost exclusively attributed to the consequences of the Russian aggression. Naturally, it is easy to see the connection, but while it is undeniably true that Putin has resorted to using Russian energy exports as a powerful weapon in retaliation for the European support of Ukraine, it is equally true that he found us an easy prey. In fact, the energy crisis in Europe started almost a year before the Russians attacked Ukraine. Already a year ago, it brought about rapid increases in energy prices, energy shortages in some parts of Europe, and the collapse of a number of energy distributors who had based their business model on the long-term stability of low energy prices. In part, at least, European energy stability fell victim to the vision of a carbon-neutral Europe, a desirable but hard-to-achieve goal, at least at this time. The rapid move towards renewable sources of energy, whose main weakness is that the amount of energy they are able to deliver fluctuates enormously and in part unpredictably this time, has marched forward despite the warning signs. The progress, such as it was, was only possible at the cost of the massive distortions of the energy markets through carbon trading schemes, green subsidies, etc., which helped to increase their use and suppress the use of traditional means of energy generation, but did little to increase the overall supply. And add to this the irrational condemnation of nuclear power generation in the German energy Wende, and we were walking a very fine line. It did not matter all that much as long as the German economy was gorging on the enormous amounts of inexpensive Russian natural gas, a fossil fuel, mind you, not as polluting as coal, but a lot more expensive. Uh, the moment the flow dried out in a series of partial and seemingly unconnected Russian moves, clearly designed not only to rob Europe of gas, but also to rob the energy market of predictability, the prices skyrocketed 
and Europe became an energy shortage market. I don't want to go into details here. It suffices for me to suggest that this was another example of self-induced blindness stemming from arrogance, hubris, and the wish to subordinate reality to wishful thinking without planning for a rainy day. At least for 10 years, since the first Ukrainian gas crisis in January 2009, we knew this might one day happen. In the aftermath of that earlier crisis, many of us Europeans, including myself, attended countless conferences on energy security to be based on self-reliance and pan-European cooperation. In the meantime, our dependency on Russian oil and gas kept increasing and would have doubled by now if the German government was not forced to suspend the Nord Stream 2 project in the face of the imminent Russian aggression two days before it started. I find no pleasure in pointing out something that makes me feel deeply depressed and unhappy, but it is a matter of record that I wrote a book of fiction about exactly this kind of security and energy crisis in Eastern Europe and published it three weeks before the start of the first Russo-Ukrainian energy crisis of 2009, and that I publicly predicted the full scale and direction of the Russian invasion and attempted occupation of Ukraine in May last year, nine months before it occurred. I have no prophetic gift and least of all in my public or private life, and uh, I no longer have access to classified intelligence. But the conclusions I made seem to me warranted by the publicly known facts, the dynamics of the developments and past precedents, including the events preceding the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. And I'm sure that I was not the only one to see the clouds gather and the storm brewing. Now, our failure is in part perfectly human. There is something about the human mind which refuses to admit the existence of evil and the possibility of the unthinkable. It is, I believe, an evolutionary trade-off, the refusal of the mind to expend emotional energy and material resources on thinking through events with a low likelihood of happening. But it is also a reverse trick that we play on our own minds, continuing to attribute a low probability to events whose likelihood is increasing by the day. It speaks to the story of the outbreak of the First World War that apparently many of the decision makers thought would not occur despite all the signs to the contrary. It speaks to the story of my Jewish relatives who did not leave Central Europe in time because they could not believe something like the Holocaust was imaginable. And it speaks to the story of Putin's aggression against Ukraine, which some people in high places denied would happen hours before it actually occurred, despite massive amount of intelligence showing it would. The other part of the story, though, is not as kind to human nature. It speaks of greed prevailing over morality, of political expediency prevailing over reality, and of futile attempts to appease an aggressor rather than confront him. In this too, we could do worse than draw on the principles that form the core of Havel's foreign policy, and that I do not hesitate to call the Havel Doctrine. In a speech in 1993, as the war in former Yugoslavia was raging on, Havel said, quote, as people who once became the victims of a shameful concession to a bully in Munich, we must know even better than others that there must not be concessions made to evil, even when it is not committed directly against us. Our indifference toward others can after all result in only one thing, the indifference of others towards us." Unquote. So, the question finally stands, how do we achieve the revolution in the sphere of human consciousness that Havel talks about in his speech to the Congress in order to behave as responsible human beings? We can write, educate, argue, persuade, cajole, or beg for the revolution in the sphere of human consciousness and 
we can try to play its imperfect models, but we cannot change that consciousness in others unless they do so themselves. Alas, Havel's great plan for an existential revolution runs into the hardwired obstacles of human nature and may perhaps never materialize. It would seem only responsible then if there were a plan B, relying on that very human nature to achieve the same or similar goals. If we were not able to predict and prevent the current crisis out of a sense of responsibility for others, perhaps we might at least face up to them out of a sense of our own self-preservation. The COVID experience has taught us that unless we act responsibly and sacrifice elements of our personal comfort and lifestyles, we or our loved ones are likely to end up on ventilation gasping for air. The disruption of the globalized change has brought home the lesson that we can actually do without some of the luxuries we became accustomed to and that spending part of each summer in an overcrowded tourist resort is not a basic human right. We may be discovering that rather than replacing the billions of our cars and other gadgets with billions of similar but carbon neutral gadgets, we could do with fewer gadgets without becoming unhappier than we already are. And we may be finding out that lowering the thermostat by a degree or two is well worth preserving our freedoms and liberties. And doing all this to help ourselves, we may be helping others. In his speech to the Italian Senate in Rome in 2004, Havel deplored, and I quote, the immensely contagious, almost aggressive idea of continuous change, permanent progress, aggrandizement, enlargement, expansion, conquest, endless growth, and endless growth of growth. Unquote. In short, he seemed to suggest that in order to preserve our freedoms, we might have to do this little less and sing about others a little more. Along with Havel's belief in the meaningfulness of moral involvement, irrespective of the results, it might just be enough for us to weather the crisis. Thank you very much. I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this wonderful keynote address. We are going to take 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A now. So there should be floating microphones. Uh, my students' assistants are, are springing to their feet. So whoever would like to pose a question, just raise your hand and they'll, they'll come right over to you. Thank you. Uh, I also grew up in the former Czechoslovakia, and I loved what you said, what Havel said to America, that they can learn from us what we experienced. Do you have the feeling that they stopped listening? Because we have the experience of Putin-like actions, and I'm sure the Central European politicians or, you know, maybe try to warn the Western world. Do you feel like they're not listening? Uh, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to this uh, because I, I remember so uh, quite a few American politicians and thinkers who, uh, who absorbed the lesson and who were trying to uh, to use it in uh, the American context. I have more experience with uh, uh, the European context and uh, uh, within the process of the Czech accession to the European Union. 
and there was uh, a line of thought at that time spearheaded by Havel, but also by others, that as we were joining the European Union and uh, learning from its experience and from its values, uh, uh, the European Union could uh, uh, internalize some of our own experience, and, uh, and I'm afraid it didn't. And, uh, uh, I'm afraid some of the less successful uh, attempts uh, by the European Union at uh, uh, shaping the society and its uh, values uh, uh, ran into the Havel, you know, belief that, uh, that uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, simply educate people, you cannot simply change their minds by uh, telling them to behave uh, uh, differently. And uh, uh, I'm sure we will talk about it in more detail tomorrow, but uh, uh, the, in my mind at least, the divisions within Europe has, uh, have uh, increased rather than diminished uh, over the years. And not just on the divide between the uh, new members of the European Union in Central and Eastern Europe and the older members, but also between the North and the South and uh, along, uh, along other dimensions. And the uh, uh, slogan for most of the time ran to drive or strive for an ever closer union. And I'm very grateful we have a European Union, but I'm not sure it's, uh, it's closer than ever, it's not. Hi, uh, Michael, that was a brilliantly disturbing presentation. Uh, I emphasize both. Okay, you did the best out of the worst. Okay, so uh, my question would be, oh, my name is Vladimir Tismanian, University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, the question is, what do you think, that assuming a bit of Havel, since you mentioned, a, let's say, a possible conversation with Havel, and your presentation was, in a way, engaging in a conversation with Havel, uh, what would be, what Havel would say, assuming he would be uh, at the summit, EU or NATO, uh, and have a conversation and respond to Viktor Orban. Uh, we know what Zelensky said. Tomorrow, Tim Snyder is going to speak about Havel and Zelensky. I remember, and most of the people here may remember, Zelensky saying very clearly, Viktor, you know what's going on in Bucha. Go to Bucha, Victor. What would happen? Would, it say, would he say, go to Bucha, Victor? That's it. Thank you, Vladimir. And I apologize for uh, the disturbing nature of my remarks. Uh, uh, I took a, you know, to quote Havel words as he really said them and not to invent what he would say in different circumstances. So you will excuse me for answering in, in a more general, uh, in more general terms. And I'm positive that Havel would be very critical of Viktor Orban, that he would, uh, 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 he would criticize him for, uh, a lack of solidarity, for a lack of responsibility, and for a lack of uh, uh, keeping true to the principles that we know Viktor Orban once uh, claimed allegiance to uh, uh, more than more than 30 years ago. That uh, of that I am I am 100% positive. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you for coming. I look forward to this and uh, bringing it uh, to my own backyard, uh, the mountain to Mohammed here. Thank you. Uh, you know, he's, he's a luminary, obviously, and luminaries come along every once in a great while in our collective human history. Can a luminary be a savior? In the opening remarks, he was referred to as a savior. But as Senator Cory Booker said to me in northern New Hampshire coming through when he was running for president, when I likened Obama to a savior, he turned and said, no, a president is not a saint or a savior. So what, what can save the world? And some days there is only hope, and some days you wake up that's, and put your feet on the floor. There isn't even hope. So please, uh, I'm being pessimistic to picking up on your theme, but where do we go from here? Thank you. Yeah. Well, Havel would certainly deny that he was a saver, savior he, that ran against the grain of his thinking. Uh, uh, he would, to your question, he would answer, you are the savers, you know, we all are the savers. And, uh, and even at the worst of times, he would reiterate his uh, belief that uh, hope is not a certainty that something will turn out well, but a belief that something has a meaning regardless of how it turns out. And, uh, uh, and that made him such an inspiring leader. He was a leader, he was not a savior, but leader he certainly was. And, uh, and what we have today, we owe in large part to him. Some people who never liked Havel and or had their own uh, reasons for, uh, uh, for not liking Havel, you know, spoke of the man as uh, a naive dreamer, an idealist who, you know, failed to, uh, to implement his principles in practice. And I always say, you know, just look at uh, uh, the history. You know, we in my country have uh, all the institutions of the rule of law, of the democratic state, of the freedom of expression, in large part thanks to Havel. We have the constitutional institutions, the constitutional court, the bicameral uh, legislation, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you know, in keeping with Havel's proposals and suggestions. We are members, we are members of NATO, and I, I was uh, in the United States as ambassador while the negotiations were going on. We would never probably get there uh, without Havel and without Valenza and maybe a couple of other people, but they played a crucial role during what was a window of opportunity we didn't realize would eventually close, but it closed with September the 11th, and, uh, and there was uh, not uh, much chance to reopen it after, uh, after, after that, and we would never uh, become members of the European Union, which uh, Havel, uh, uh, repeatedly argued was the manifest destiny for, uh, uh, for, for our own country. So for a dreamer, this is, you know, quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Hi, um, my name is Rose Donaldson, and I just had a question about the n your notion on globalization as a destabilizing, um, I guess, phenomenon for the world. And to some point, I do see that, like, for instance, COVID and entanglements with Russia has made things more difficult, but also hasn't globalization brought together the international community of different countries, which would n have no idea of what's going on in Ukraine, have no feelings to it, be completely independent of what is happening. Isn't globalization, in that view, a stabilizing um, indicator of like progression or 
democracy? Well, uh, I, I wonder, I, I, I have to admit. I mean, the, by far and large, the most robust globalization route existing is between the United States, North America, Europe, and China. And I have not seen any signs of democratization in, in China, on the contrary, and it is rapidly becoming our next crisis. Uh, so uh, uh, we, in where I live in Europe, you know, we were keenly aware of uh, uh, the problems in Ukraine and the problems in Russia before we even started to speak about globalization. I, 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 I do not deny that uh, uh, globalization has also helped uh, information flows uh, uh, for, uh, for most of the last two decades, but the recently even the information flows are being closed off censored, suppressed by uh, countries uh, that clearly like to benefit from uh, the uh, uh, fruits of economic globalization, but not from the information exchange and, uh, and openness. This concludes uh, tonight's program. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, we are going to continue tomorrow with panels starting at 9 a.m. It'll be two in the morning and then two in the afternoon. Once again, the program is, is online, uh, havel.colby.edu. So I hope to see many of you, many of you here. Um, uh, once again, thank you very much. <laughs>